That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give a presentation here. My name is Andrew Johnson. Um, and like many of you, I like to experiment with responsive typography. And I'm really excited to show you some of the experiments that I've done in augmented reality and share what I've learned. And at the same time, you'll also see some random parts of my neighborhood. So a little while ago, I decided to take a Chinese painting class with some friends, and we didn't really know what to expect. Um, before it got started, our instructor showed us some very beautiful examples of work that he had done. He painted things like flower blossoms and trees, um, and he tells us that we're going to start with birds. Uh, so at first, he gives us these very small drops of concentrated ink that we try and mix with water, and this takes a long time to get right. And then our instructor gives us some rice paper. And we're finally ready to paint. And as a designer, thinking I'm knowing what I'm doing, I put my brush down. And this happens. Um, this looks nothing like a bird. Um, and it was quite bad. And I tried putting less ink on my brush, trying to do some other things. Trying to move my brush faster, take different approaches. And eventually, I got closer to something that somewhat resembles a bird. And there were a lot of things that I did wrong. Uh, rice paper is very absorbent, and this requires a lot of practice and experience with the medium that I didn't have. We're all familiar with the feeling of trying a new medium. Maybe that's physical properties of material, like paper or wood if we're carving something. But it's also our tools and our code that we use. It's the syntax we use to write our programs or our GUIs that we're using to design whatever sort of interfaces or other sorts of designs. And we know that type is very, <laughs> very used to changing mediums. Um, all of these have had their own sort of technological constraints and required type designers to adapt and change how they design their type. In his article, What is Code? Writer and technologist Paul Ford has this quote. And he says, the last turn of the century, British artist William Morris once said that you can't have art without resistance in the materials. The computer and its multifarious peripherals are the materials. So in AR, all these sensors and inputs and cameras are other computer peripherals. These are just like a mouse or a touchpad, things that we need to build off of and around. And these are part of the medium that we need to build off and use. So there's been some really amazing experiments with our medium. And before I mention any of these that you can see here, it's important to recognize Muriel Cooper and her students work at the Visual Language Workshop in MIT Media Lab. They did a lot of early work on 3D type and information in 3D spaces. But there's been a lot of awesome experiments recently, too. I don't have time to go through them all here. Um, but a few recent ones have been Vishnu Ganti's 3D type, variable fonts like Frida Mandrano's, uh, Javen variable font, Andy Klammer's Arduino sensor experiments, um, work by Eric Van Blockland, and really work done by the speakers here as well fall into this category um, of trying to push the medium and do something new with it. So real time is another medium that affects how we design and use type. And since we're new to this, we have lots of questions, right? We have this general notion of 3D, um, and we're not exactly sure how to build something in it um, or how it actually works. And this leads us to the obvious question, what implications are there for type and our interfaces? So similar to painting that bird or trying to paint that bird, I did a bunch of AR type experiments to learn more. And I hope to share my imperfect process with you um, so you can start experimenting and asking the same questions for yourself in your own experiments. So to talk about these things first, I have to go back in time. And a few years ago, I wrote a sister article to Nick Sherman's article on variable fonts. The article showed a proof of concept of a variable font back in 2015, and we found that it was a really fun way to experiment with what was possible, try new things. At the same time, I still wanted to try and find other use cases for variable fonts, right? Like, what, can, uh, what, what else can they be used for, uh, aside from fitting to different boxes or shapes? And I love working with other people, so I continued to look for collaborations at that time, and I ended up talking with Eric Van about some ideas. We wanted to try and pull interpolating typography into AR, and we wanted to it to respond to distance. I realized that in AR, we have very easy access to both the reader's position and the text and where these are relative to each other. So our first question here is where do we start, uh, of course. 
Um, on the software side, there are a lot of tools that are disposable that we can use. Um, and to prototype quickly, I chose Unity, which is a game engine. And Unity builds to both ARKit and ARCore. Within the actual design, our first big question was, how do we display text in 3D? So first, we need to understand how 3D meshes work. This is a 3D mesh of a cube primitive, so very simple. Um, it's made up of vertex positions or nodes. A cube has eight. It's made up of edges. A cube has 12 faces, which are just the sides, right? Like any sort of die. A cube has six. And at first I thought, you know, these are just like points on a font. Can I go in and maybe move these around or control these points? That's not so hard, right? It turns out that it's a little bit more complicated than that in 3D. There are multiple steps for bringing something into 3D, and we can start with SVG and font paths, but for real-time 3D rendering, these actually need to be converted at some point to triangles. So remember this about triangles, because we'll come back to it at some point. But we use triangles in game rendering because they're the simplest primitive, simplest shape. Um, and if we want, we can take this and extrude it to a 3D mesh. So after realizing this, I came back to Eric with some very unrealistic constraints. Um, we needed to build something composed entirely of boxes, entirely of squares or four-sided polygons in order to keep the interpolation simple with the meshes. Uh, but he was still able to draw this, and it was really cool. I'm not a type designer, so um, I would not have been able to do this. And these are the shapes that are imported into Unity. You can see that there's an individual quad, um, and we used a set of coordinate points to generate this, and we have one for each master. You can see that one of the quads is also selected here, so it's a composite, I guess, font or a composite image. So remember how I was just mentioning triangles before? Well, each quad is made up of two triangles, and here's how we deal with tries in C Sharp. If we're looking straight at the quad, or the side that we can see, first we need to uh, generate, this, uh, generate the triangles here, and we need to connect the dots. So this would be in a clockwise order, and the first triangle will be points B, C, and D. The second triangle will be, po be points B, D, and A. And that's the mesh part. This is sort of the outside construction of whatever we want to render in 3D. But what about measuring distance? We can measure distance in meters between the camera, which represents the user, and then an object in real space. And from there, we can do some math to fit it to an interpolation scale. And this process took a lot of experimentation to get this right. Um, I don't remember how many times I rebuilt um, things to, to get things feeling better. But we were able to put something together um, that was interpolating based off of distance. And for this video, we actually used a Lego car in order to keep it somewhat stable as a dolly track. And you can see that Santa Fe and the mile section are alternating how big they are based off of distance. So what's interesting here is that hierarchy is shifting based off of that distance, um, something that's not super new. Um, but I wrote a blog post on it and then kind of forgot about it. And some time passed and more time. But that ended up leading to more so collaborations and more ideas with people. Uh, CJ Dunn approached me to build a type specimen for his unrealized type-based Lovet. Lovet has an optical hairline axis for the serifs, and we wanted to showcase this based off of a person's distance to it. So you can see here that um, sort of the height of these serifs are changing as he's uh, moving the axis. Right, so how do we bring fonts into a 3D environment? We can't just use font base, this isn't the web. And we've already tried meshes, they're very complex. So type-wise, Unity has a couple of different options. It has text components and sign distance fields. First, we tried using text components. And how do these work? Well, font materials wrap mesh quads. So similar how we had structure before, we can sort of wrap these in materials. Each letter is packed with a material, and this is called a font atlas. And you can see a few of the letters here in the assets below towards the center. I think it's a H, a W, uh, maybe a Q. And from there, Unity uses free type for its rasterization. So why can't we just use that? We would, <laughs> except it gets blurry. Textures are raster, so they're resolution dependent. And if you've ever walked up very close to some sort of wall or object in a video game, then you know what this looks like. And at first, we thought this would be a problem when we walked up to the typeface to inspect it from up close. 
So the other option is sign distance builds, and these are an older approach. Uh, the game company Valve introduced this technique way back in 2007, and these have a bunch of different renditions. There's different uh, uh, pros and cons to them, but this is Unity's interface for generating them, and you can, you can kind of see how these are uh, a bit of a gradient or blurred. And the way these work is they uh, store letters in a texture, but they use the alpha value from the letter or how light or dark the pixel they're reading from uh, to represent the distance to sort of a final vectorized version of the letter. And then from there, code can render the font using different color channels and other information that we can pack into that texture. So the type here is using a sign distance field font. And I don't know if you can see what's wrong with it, depending on how far you're sitting away maybe, um, but it looks pretty good. Um, at the same time, there's also some effects and some weird things that are going on here. For one, it's less sharp. Um, and then there's also a small break at the end of the E. And this might not be such a huge issue, except for us in Lovett's hairlines, they caused a lot of problems. It was essentially disappeared. We couldn't see it anymore. So here's a video of my apartment. It's a little bit messy. <laughs> but in order to simulate variable fonts, we loaded a bunch of discrete font files and revealed and hid these based off of distance. And you can see that the distance in meters has a certain relationship to the axis here. You can also see how the hairlines are essentially disappearing when you get close because of the sign distance field fonts. So because of this, we decided to go back to normal text components. And this wasn't without problems. We still broke things a lot. And this is what happens when you try and change the font, but you forget to change the font material. And I mean, it looks pretty cool. I love glitchy things. I love distorting type. But for us, this was not what we were going for. But we were able to make a type specimen with the built in the optical axis. And you can see that the hairlines get thinner as you approach and then thicker as you move backwards. What I think is so interesting about this is that we can make subtle optical adjustments based off of distance. And a font's representation can be tied to a user's place in space. And placing letters and numbers in 3D space isn't something new. This is Emmanuel Moreau's forest of numbers, and it used randomly positioned layers of numbers to express the year 2017. So I started collaborating with David Jonathan Ross and playing around with ideas inspired by force of numbers. And this creates a 3D uh, matrix around yourself. Um, and these numbers are based off of your distance to each one. From there, it creates a color gradient based off of those values. And it's pretty fun, um, but at the same time, it makes you a little bit sick to look out for a while. Um, <laughs> and this is when we learn that just because it can be 3D doesn't mean that it should be. So from there, we tried to simplify it. We tried creating a flat panel of numbers uh, using one of David's custom typefaces. We tried experimenting and trying to change the size of the numbers or change the color, all of this based off of distance. And the effect actually still wasn't too engaging visually. David suggested making the numbers maybe bigger as you got closer. And this helped a lot. This gave us a more engaging effect. Uh, especially in AR, it's helpful for people to have a single object or thing to focus on. And this brought us to effects like this. And here's a small park outside my apartment. And we were able to place this number panel in world space. And it turned out to have a pretty neat cascading effect. The uh, thing that everyone who makes these sort of videos won't tell you, though, is that you get some pretty awkward looks from people while recording these. Um, yeah, people were probably wondering why I was walking around in circles in this park. <laughs> but the key thing here is that content itself can change based off of a person's proximity to it. Uh, proximity to an object or any sort of thing, not just its style. And this isn't anything new, right? In 2011, Ethan Marcotte wrote the book Responsive Web Design. Um, I can't believe that's 2011. And it outlined ways that our media should adapt to different conditions. A big reference of his in the book was responsive architecture back from the 1960s. And this falls into two main categories. It's a, it's a huge subject. And one of these categories is a building's ability to adapt to evolving needs of the inhabitants or the people inside the building. And then the other one is the building's ability to suit changing outdoor weather conditions, things like lighting or climate. The Aegis hyposurface, built in 2001 by Decoi, responded to both the user and the environment. 
And if this was a mechanical facade that could deform based on people's movement, based on sound, based on light. And we can actually do the same thing in AR. So remember how text is just a font material stretched across a mesh? Well, we can deform these meshes with code. Similar to the hyposurface, I was able to distort type by moving these mesh vertices, and it caused a pretty cool ripple effect. The camera is also pretty shaky because it was very cold outside. So this means that we can push and pull type in a z-axis, so text can be volumetric. And to better understand how 3D space works in AR, it's really important that we look at the hardware that enables it. So on the hardware side, there's two main categories, phones and headsets. Phones, pretty simple, we're familiar with these. Um, on these, phones are the window to our AR, so we have uh, a very limited view and we need to hold our phone up and move it around in order to see different things. To do this, phones use a combination of the device camera, uh, infrared sensors actually, and accelerometers to estimate where you will move potentially. So AR headgear is much more experimental. Um, I don't know who of you might have tried it yet, um, but it's under development by companies like DeepMotion, Magic Leap, and Microsoft. And there's a very different set of human factors for these devices. For one, you have a much wider field of view, and the human eye can actually look about 60 degrees in any direction. Our necks can swivel about 120 degrees. And this is sort of a like a, a good bounds or the rule of thumb for when we design experiences in AR. Headsets, the other th thing they do that's very interesting is they estimate focal points based on eye tracking. So it simulates how our vision blurs as we focus on different objects at different distances. And I talked with a developer about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he said it still has a long way to go. It was sort of zooming when he didn't want it to, but it's crazy that this is based off of our eyes um, just through the device. The other thing is headsets rely on light projection. So objects and text in headset experiences are not completely opaque. White makes things more bright, where black would be 100% transparent. It doesn't show. Some headsets are actually darkened by default, just like sunglasses, to make up for this. And knowing this, we can think about how our type reacts to light. So ARKit lets you get light intensity and color temperature. And normally this is used for changing lighting of 3D models and shadows, things like that. But we can also use it to change text color. With this code, I made light reactive typography and this experiment pushed the text color in the opposite direction of whatever ambient light was around it. This would help it stay readable in different conditions. So AR type can really appear in any background. Um, and having type adapt to lighting just makes a lot of sense, especially for environments with changing lighting like the outdoors. So by show of hands, how many of you ride bikes to get places outdoors? Okay, maybe like 30%, so a good amount. Um, the bike roads look awesome here, um, but in the US, it's very hard to bike around sometimes. We have things like this. <laughs> this is a road in my city, um, and you just kind of look at this and say, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? I can't go into the, the road, it's too dangerous. But here's what bike paths also look like in my city, and everyone's familiar with these. But these have actually really fascinated me recently. Um, they're designed with the user's distance in mind, and they're skewed in order to be more readable from a certain perspective. So this is the same bike pack uh, path icon, excuse me. Its skew is even more apparent when you're viewing it from directly above. And it's not really meant to be seen from completely overhead. This does not mean a very tall person on a bicycle with oval wheels. It's designed for distance. So lane signage allows us to label a specific surface instead of relying on a separate sign that's farther away. And there are a lot of parallel examples in art and design. Uh, this is a chalk drawing by Tracy Lee Stum, and this painting uses our perspective to create an illusion of depth. Anamorphic typography, a project by Joseph Egan and Hunter Thompson also does this. It's only readable in a certain angle and it engages us in our space. Pentagram did a cool project uh, called Fit Nation that encourages you to move throughout the space. And this is smart because it supports the whole concept of fitness. 
and it gives you different levels of information based on your viewing angle and distance. So it's clear that there's lots of interesting examples of using space and rooting angles in art and design. So I decided to test some ideas for making type more readable from different angles. And I tried a few different strategies for this. For one, we could just do nothing. We could track out the letters in 3D space. We could also interpolate the width and make the letters and relationships wider. The last thing that we can do is billboard the font, which means directly pointed at the viewer at all times. So I tested these different approaches in Unity, and thanks to Bianca Burning, I was able to get the variable font Ven, which has a very extreme width axis, and it also has a very readable sort of narrow axis, so it was perfect for this project. And you can see what's happening behind the scenes here from an angle perspective. Each one of these approaches uh, does something different, except the first one, which isn't doing anything. So here you can see how these are all affected differently by distance. And for me, out of these four cases, interpolating width was the most interesting because it allowed the text to stay on the same plane, just like road signage. So I tried this in AR, of course, and this type adjusts as you walk around it. You can see a comparison between the static type here up top and the one below that's interpolating, so it's more readable at wide angles. This is a park by my apartment as well. And for vertical signs, this range of motion might look something like this. But I also wanted to try flat items lying on a surface. And flat items like a table are different from vertical standing ones. For one, you can walk entirely around them, right? Um, I could walk around this podium. Uh, but they also need another axis, and because of this I needed both width and height masters. So at first I tried to use a combination of the width and the font size, but this got hard to make equal proportional changes in each direction. So I wanted to be a cool kid, and I did the obvious thing, and I designed another sans serif typeface, just like everyone else. <laughs> but this font has a proportional width and it has a proportional height. And this made it much more predictable and manageable with how it would sit in the interface and how much space that it would take up uh, within whatever design. And with that font, I made a clock that aimed to be more readable from different angles. And again, just like all of these projects, it took a lot of experimentation. And I realized, for one thing, that people would never view something from a complete 90 degree angle. Um, so setting the max angle to something like 60 degrees made a lot more sense. And you can see that the surface area of the text is changing. And this has some of the most interesting implications for AR type. That is that optical AR typography can take up different amount of or different amount of space based on your viewing angle. If there's one thing that you walk away with, I hope it would be this. But at the same time, we've been really focused on making sure that type fits in boxes, right? From a long time ago, since movable type, to text columns and grids that we use to set our type, both in our design programs and the web. This is the medium of the web, <laughs> again. This is the whole box model in CSS. This is when we use things like rack components and view components. The whole idea is to encapsulate them in a box. We know this so well that we have jokes about breaking it as well, too. And we also make flexible containers and grids. These are a really important part of web design. We have things inside them adapt, so we have concepts of variable fonts that can fit their containers. We also have ideas of type that can stretch to fill different amount a different amount of space in AR. And this is super awesome. Um, it's exciting because it gives us a ton of flexibility with our layout and our design and how we uh, build things. But at the same time, we also have to realize how it constrains how we think and how it influences the types of reading experiences that we design within our programs. I think everyone knows exactly what this is. And dogs seem to be a theme today. <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll let this dogs or maybe like this dog, fonts have outgrown their containers. I love this picture. So historically, we've forced type into boxes and grids. 
but all of the experiments that we just walked through are cases where type is not restricted by the box or its container. Instead, they take inputs coming from completely outside the 2D layout. They're separate inputs altogether. So this means that the entire space around adaptive type should be open to change. This is a Lego instruction, proof of concept. And the bottom panel adapts to fill the optical needs of the typography instead of the other way around. So what does our medium look like? We're still learning, but in AR, the medium is no longer flat or confined to a box. And instead, typography can try and interactively maintain the best possible reading relationship with the viewer. This means we need to think more about our environment, what's around us, and how we exist in our environment, and typography's relation to both of these. This also means that the space that type exists in has to adapt to. And in AR, adaptive typography should influence layout just as much as layout influences type. In this way, we can create type that's more accessible, exciting, and thoughtful in AR. Thank you.